Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Zanella Morrison from CNBC Africa, and we're talking destination marketing. So much has been said about this particular topic, but is it really fully understood? I really look forward to unpacking not only what it is from a technical perspective, but also to have a look at how each country views destination marketing as a tool for improving economic development, uh, empowering young people, youth, and really just lifting the economies of the continent. And with me today, for this conversation, it's really an honor to have Mr. Temba Kumalo, the acting CEO of South African Tourism. Thank you for joining me. Ms. Patricia Ondeng, acting CEO of the Kenyatta International Convention Center, and Mr. Frank Murangwa, Director of Destination Marketing at the Rwanda Convention Bureau. So we're going to talk about destination marketing. Let's first unpack it. What is it? What does it do for a country, and why is it so critical? that we as citizens and as uh, business people understand its value to us. Perhaps, Tamba, we can start with you. Well, good afternoon and good afternoon to all of the viewers in the room and, and around the world. So, the first thing is about how you grow an economy, how you get money into, you know, into an economy. The first way is to have great products, that you then trade with the rest of the world. So that's import-export. You send out the product. In comes in, you know, the foreign investment. The second way is in getting great projects on the ground, whether directly or through the stock exchange, and you get people investing in those projects. And the third way is to get people to physically come into your economy and spend money in your economy. So destination marketing is actually... Drive, you know, drives all three of those pillars. Uh, at times, you know, we look at it, uh, you, we look at each of those as separate, but they, they really work together. So that's the first thing about destination marketing. The second thing is that a country or a venue or a place is defined by its geographic location on the planet, you know, the GPS coordinates. And at times people say that doesn't matter, it actually does. You know, an island is defined by it being an exotic place. Uh, you know, South Africa, for example, being at the tip of the African continent will be defined by that distance. And the continent of Africa will be defined by the perceptions that people have about the continent in its totality. It is also defined by what you have underneath the surface of the earth. So some countries have got oil, have got minerals. So they'll, they'll be defined by that. And then others will be defined by what they build on top of, you know, the, the, you know, the, the surface of, of the country, whether it is nature-given or whether it is, you know, uh, human-made. Uh, and that defines what you build your offering on. Mm. But it is the soul of the people that really defines one place from another. And it is the intent of the leadership of a destination or of a place on how they use what is man-made, God-given, and what is in the soul of the people in order to create a proposition. I love that. That is really what it is all about. But ultimately, it is about getting money into the economy in order to positively impact the lives of the citizens of a given country. And that is how I would define destination marketing. I'm deliberately staying away from brand proposition, which is a completely separate topic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You've really laid a great foundation. Uh, better still for you, Patricia, to step on. You have been doing this for a while and you have an amazing destination for the world. So how are you defining it and holding it in Kenyatta? Thank you very much. I wouldn't have said it better. My brother has really laid it out for everybody. However, um, for the KICC, KICC is, is an icon in itself. Of course, we will take cognizance of the fact that um, tourism, for example, it's, it's labor intensive. So in terms of economy, it really uh, grows. Um, the country is able to get a lot of uh, finances through it. Being that... Um, like in KICC, for example, 
when we get in like international events, when they come in, we just not uh, go for a particular uh, maybe conference. Other than that, we also do additionals in terms of uh, what is it that the delegate is going to be able to experience. We show them all the places that they can be able to enjoy, not just coming in for uh, basic conferencing. No. In Nairobi, uh, it's the only city with a national park. It's amazing. So we have our amazing culture. We have, um, of course, the wildlife. So it is combined together. We just don't go for one thing. Okay? And um, however, I would say that, uh, like, uh, the last, last week, there was some release that was done by the, our Kenyan Bureau of Statistics. And uh, tourism, let me just get it. Mm. We had uh, a growth. Remember, we are from COVID. Our growth was uh, 54.7%. The international delegates came in, grew by 54.7, while the local grew in by 47.7. So can you imagine 54 and 47? It's not really uh, a very big margin. Mm -hmm. But you can see that this is where uh, any country must invest in to mm -hmm. be able to get the much needed dollar mm -hmm. uh, shillings, Kenya shilling, uplift the lives of our, of our communities, especially the women, youth. And I love that that is what you, you talked about. In our government, for example, we are having a financial model called bottom-up economy, and who else can do it better? Because since, uh, like I said, it is uh, labor intensive. Mm -hmm. Who are these labor? The labor will be our women and our youth, of course, our fast growing youth. And it is very, uh, it, the youth has really taken up tourism to another level. Mm -hmm. They are more adventurous, they are outgoing. They may not really like being confined in a conference without any other thing to do. So that, of course, will increase the revenue of any country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You know, when you're speaking about it, how different is the value proposition of South Africa versus, you know, it's really the packaging and the soul of a place. It's as simple as that. It's actually not more complicated. So we, we might give it a fancy name, but it's really the beautiful packaging of above ground, underground, its people, its products. But Rwanda uh, um, poses a very interesting interesting one as well. I think, I think you've managed to really distill what destination marketing means for you and how you've managed to position yourself amongst all of us uh, if we were to compete. Uh, thank you, Andy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so delighted to be part of this, Andy. Uh, I define destination marketing in the two ways. One is the, really what we're doing at Meetings Africa. We at Meetings Africa to do business. And when you're doing business, uh, it means that you're contributing to your overall vision as a country uh, that is making changes to your community, giving jobs to your people, and you're contributing really to overall branding of the, of, of the country, of a city. And so uh, our purpose here is really to showcase what we're doing as a country. And the, there's no better platform than really Meetings Africa where we're able to connect with the, uh, so many hosted buyers that are here, but also be able to connect with the, our sister countries that are here. There's no better way to tell the story really than that. Uh, the, the other element we see in the destination marketing is really to be a uh, big part of the big picture of your own country and your own city. Uh, the reason why this is quite important for all of us is because what we do uh, makes a huge impact that goes down to the uh, lowest level in our communities. And in that way, we're able to justify, <clears throat> excuse me, and be able to confirm that when we come here to get business, the business will go back and really uh, make an impact to our uh, communities. And that's why we, we, we are so fortunate to be the channel. Uh, as people that really lead our destinations in terms of marketing, we, we become the channel of uh, a voice to reach a bigger audience that eventually come to our, our countries and contribute to overall mm. uh, economic mm. development. Mm. But now it comes in different forms and shapes. This weekend, I was down in Cape Town and I got to see the racing happening in the waterfront. And until you actually sit there and you, and you realize the broad spectrum of opportunities that are available from racing to what you're saying now, the business event. From a South African perspective, Temba, what do you think is possible for South Africa? So... Here it is. When you go to any place, you know, you can um, see a convention center, be part of the infrastructure. You can, um, you know, engage in uh, the food of the place. You can engage, you know, with, with various aspects of it. But what really differentiates a place is how it makes you feel. 
how it makes you feel when you're there, how it makes you feel when you leave, and what stories it enables you to tell about yourself, about your own experiences that you would not be able to tell had you not gone to that particular place. So we run a survey uh, at the airports, at all the ports of, of, of entry and exit. And we interview people as they come into the country, especially first-time visitors, about what they expect to see. And then we interview them on the way out to see, you know, what happened. You know, uh, was there any transformative impact? And the two most consistent sentiments that we get out of the research is one, joy. The, the, there's a feeling of, of, of inner transformation when people come into South Africa. And I think it's true of the continent, to be honest. You know, it is, I did not expect to feel this way. And I was able to, you know, uh, be impacted and access a part of my soul that I would not be able to access if I was somewhere else in the world. So that is the first one. It's not happiness because happiness is fleeting. Joy is lasting. It's, it's enduring. The second one is freedom. And freedom is not a political, you know, state. Freedom is open spaces, an open state of mind. Uh, you know, the, the shattering of stereotypes that you might have had about a place that then get replaced with the truth that transforms you and the way in which you view yourself and the way in which you view the world. So from an overall proposition standpoint, that is what we want people to feel when they come to the, to, you know, to... to South Africa and what mm. they must feel when they come to the continent, to be honest. Mm. Now, it's in the orchestration of the value chain that is important. So a conference like this, this is just a convention center, but it's the entertainment, it's the food, it's the lighting, uh, it's the facilitators, it's, <laughs> you know, it's the use of color, it's mm. the use of sound. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's really impacting all of the five senses and the sixth one in order to bring forward, a you know, a, transform, a freedom and a joy yeah. that you would not experience somewhere else. And this is not just at a leisure level. It is also at a business level. Mm. I mean, I was walking around on the floor a little bit earlier on. And the energy in the room, the, 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 there's something, you know, almost palpable about people getting together and, and, and exchanging ideas mm. and trading you know, it's, it's almost like the, you know, the feeling you get at an African market, you know, on the street. And that you cannot experience anywhere else except on the African continent. And that is what the essence of our proposition is. And I think our brothers and sisters brought more of that, to be honest. Oh, yeah. right? they, they brought that feeling of a really vibey uh, place to be in. Um, and if I think about Nairobi and I think about Kenyatta, I think I remember absolutely it was the food and the beach, the color of the sea and the sand. So how do you package that? How do you package that and, and tell the world that you need to come see this? Because, you know, you, I can look at a picture and I can do comparison. But how do you capture the essence of what your country would be about and let, let it be a destination that people want to go to? In Kenya, we call it the magical Kenya. Magical Kenya. Magical Kenya. I can hear the, I can hear the music. The magical radio. <clears throat> so it's all-inclusive. Uh, what my brother didn't, uh, I would like to add one other aspect, and that is the warmth of the people of Kenya, and the peace and the smiles. We are always happy. This is us every day. We don't have stress. And, and we're very welcoming in Kenya. Oh, I'm not saying South Africans, you're not welcome. It welcoming. is so true. <laughs> yeah, wow, no, if you we, come to we, Kenya. We have issues right now, so. Ah, no problem, okay. So. <laughs> I am not going to go with your issues. Bad will, timing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go ahead you're with your we, happiness. We will teach you how to welcome and be warm. And of course, our culture is amazing. You all know the Maasai culture. However, we have 47, 47 other communities. The government uh, is really uh, a big player in Kenya because it supports, like I said, the bottom-up kind of um, economy where we are, we are uh, able to facilitate our young ones to be able to make life, I mean, get something out of life in terms of tourism. So tourism for us, destination marketing for us, it's just, it's our nature. It is like the DNA of, of Kenya. 
Mm-hmm. And, and all of us sitting here now, we're all growing economies and, and, and desperately changing our country to, to be able to host some of the best events um, that are possible, that are available to pull. From R- Rwanda, I know your strategy is very tight on what kind of events you want to be hosting. How have you managed to spread that, that culture, that joy and, and that warmth, but then also say, you know, we're going to pull these really big business events or or, or, or entertainment events? Uh, th- thank you. It's a, for us, I think, as, as Rwanda, it's been a, uh, uh, a very clear strategy because we, uh, business events was identified as one of the drivers for the economic development of the country. And so with that, it became very easy for, for, for us as the, as the Bureau and the entire government that we aligned. And that helps us to really uh, look at the priority sectors. And then a lot of events we host in our country uh, aligned with our priority sectors, looking at ICT, looking at medical, looking at uh, agriculture, looking at uh, tourism and services in general. So we look at what is priority for the country so that we really create experience. As the, my brother and sister are saying, we need to create experience that is going to uh, leave legacies to our cities. We're not just sitting here and meeting and doing events for the sake of doing it, but we need to really create long-lasting uh, legacies. And that's what we've done in the country. And uh, we look at really priority sectors, we look at priority issues uh, that are affecting the region and the, the continent, and we drive conversation towards that. Because we know at the end of those conversations, uh, key decisions are going to be taken that are going to create positive impact to our societies and our communities. And uh, I think if I, you may just recall, last year we hosted one of the big events, uh, the Commonwealth Heads of Government Annual Meeting, which was really a huge event for the country and the, uh, for the continent. And with the success of that, uh, so many events have managed to come to Kigali. And uh, we take this opportunity of coming to Meetings Africa here. It opens doors for others. And uh, that's really uh, an experience we've had in Rwanda. Uh, Chogam was a success, and uh, immediately after that, we got an opportunity to host the FIFA Congress that is uh, are going to be hosted in March. And that came as a result of uh, hosting some of the major events. So we really look at uh, what, what are the key issues out there? How can we be part of those conversations and be able to drive the results we all want as the continent? And what is the strategy? How is that strategy supported through infrastructure, through other elements? Because it doesn't help that if the infrastructure is not adequate, tourists are not going to be happy and visitors are not going to be happy. Is the, does this need to go in tandem? Yeah, uh, absolutely. We, uh, it, it has to be aligned. Because when you're talking about to, you know, promoting and marketing all destinations for business events, the first things we, we promote are our venues, our infrastructures. And so uh, w- what has worked in Rwanda is uh, we had really a very clear vision that we wanted to position Rwanda as a hub uh, for the corner. And it's really working out. Looking at where we've come uh, in 2013, Rwanda and the Kigali were nowhere on the African map to host the events. But as we speak, uh, Kigali is number two on the continent and Rwanda is number three. And that came as a result of really concerted efforts from government, but also from the private sector. Our government invested in the infrastructure. We have now two major, uh, three major convention centers and venues, uh, Kigali Convention Center, Inhari Conference Arena, and BK Arena as major events, uh, venues that can host up to 10,000 people. Uh, but in, in tandem, we had also to invest in our airline, National Rwanda, uh, that is really uh, flying across the continent. And with that, we've been able to really uh, fly people to the continent. Uh, not only that, we were able to simplify access to the country. As you know, uh, everyone uh, gets visa on arrival when you're planning to come to Rwanda. Just come and get your visa on arrival. And it's also not only just visa on arrival for the African Union community, for Frankfurt community, for a Commonwealth community, uh, you get a visa free for a whole month. And that really encourages people to come to our country. And it forms part of the strategy to really bring in business to your city and your country. Mm. I'm very impressed and very happy. Um, but it also highlights for me challenges that we're having from a South African perspective. And uh, 
Temba, if I look at the role of government, as he's mentioned, how important government is in ensuring that they put everything else in place. So we're currently facing a number of challenges as a country. But I think those challenges also go to the consumer and they create negative sentiment towards anything that you are trying to do if government is not doing what they need to do or needing to support. You know, how are we going to turn it around from a South Africa perspective that, that we get government to really be a trusted partner in the decisions we are trying to make to to improve the economy of the country. Okay, so I'll come to, 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 to that question in, in, in a moment. But I want to position it on the platform of exceptionalism. So as a destination, you've got to make a choice about where you're going to position in terms of the, you know, the, the, the value hierarchy. And if you take motor vehicles as an example, you take a, uh, you know, I like Mercedes-Benz, right? So they'll advertise, you know, the top of the range Mercedes-Benz to create the aspiration for the category. But they're really going to get the money by selling all of the lower, you know, uh, level cars. So you S, you know, 63, but you're going to sell a whole lot of C-class Mercedes-Benz. And it's, it's a positioning issue. And it's also a an intentional issue about how you're going to trade in the world. South Africa is an exceptional destination. And we pick the things that differentiate us in the world, that we're absolutely exceptional about. If you take our wildlife, you take our, you know, our game resorts, our five-star game resorts, they're unparalleled in the world. Absolutely exceptional. You take our hotels, absolutely exceptional. Our high-end restaurants, even our, you know, the beach experience, you go down, you know, to, you know, to, to the coast, absolutely exceptional. And we position ourselves like that, not because we are excluding the rest of the pyramid, but because when you position at that level, you create a tier of, ex of aspiration that then tr holds the quality of the destination, but then pulls the volume through. And that is how we've chosen to position ourselves. That then also means that in terms of how you then orchestrate across government, you have to be selective about how you go about doing things. And therefore, some of our policies might look like they're restrictive, but they're not restrictive. They're actually selective. And there's a, dis there's a difference between the two. Where I agree that there is room for improvement is in, in the airlift strategy, right? So what we found in, you know, in, the, in the recovery from, uh, you know, from COVID is that the recovery of airlines flying back into, the, you know, uh, in, in, into, into, South, into uh, South Africa, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. I mean, I just came off a 26-hour flight to a South American country where I had to go up into the Middle East and then back down. But I went there so that we can recover direct airlift so that we can cut that down from 28, I mean, 26 hours back down to eight and a half hours. And that is really where, you know, a lot of the effort of government, you know, has been focused to make sure that the value chain of our tourism platform, you know, is rebuilt. And there's absolutely strong policies that are in place and follow through in recovering in, the, in, in, in that regard. That's the first thing. The second thing is that for our supply side, the supply side of, you know, of our industry, you know, to, to function, the policies of government facilitate for us to be able to trade. So in fact, government, I believe, is doing everything that is supposed to be done in order for us to drive our tourism recovery in a way that is responsible, in a way that preserves the positioning, and in a way that manages the recovery and does not destabilize other aspects of our economy. So I've got no issues whatsoever in terms of how we are orchestrating our recovery. Rather be more deliberate and more intentional than rushing and then having to roll back, as we have seen happen in other you know, parts, parts of the world. So absolutely exceptional. Let me then go on to you know, the, the other aspect of exceptionalism as a proposition. If you look at exports, exports are not only products. Exports are also people. Exports a culture. You know, we've got exceptional South Africans that are doing well in the rest of the world. 
So how do you leverage that? And that is actually a continental issue. We export our music. We export our film stars. We export you know, our way of life, our food, etc. But I think as a continent, we are suboptimal in how we leverage it on foreign soil in order for people to understand that that fine cuisine that they're eating is mm. actually of African origin. And being yeah. able to use that as part of the repatriation of a disproportionately higher uh, 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 you know, share of the, tourist, of the tourism pie. Mm -hmm. So our strategy is all around driving that. Mm -hmm. And it's not a short-term strategy. Let me just round this off. It's not a short-term yes. strategy. You, you know, at times when you recover, you need to do things now, knowing that you'll only see the impact of it in five to ten years' time. So we're actually being very deliberate about how we do that recovery mm. for long-term sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Temba. Patricia, you know, for me, when I, when I, let, let's go back to, 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 to Kenyas and, and what he's talking about, about products. You've really stood the test of time in terms of the kinds of products, the kinds of people, the kinds of culture that you have held um, and that you've marketed to the world. It hasn't changed from 15 years ago you know, to now. It's been really consistent. But what I'm also appreciating about it is that it's very, it's very citizen intensive. And am I correct? Am I correct in saying that everybody in Kenya, in some form or shape, or in, in Nairobi, as an example, um, or in, um, in, even in Rwanda, where in my travels, every single citizen is selling, owns the business, uh, owns the hotel. Um, the food is very local. Um, but it's also produced locally and utilized locally. You know, it's your own, it's your own juice, it's your own this, it's your own that. What is, what, it, it, and, and I'm correct by that, but what is the bigger strategy and how do you see that lifting the economy as a whole when everybody's able to participate and not just some? Thank you for that. For Kenya, <coughs> sorry about that. One of the most amazing things about Kenya is, uh, like I said, the nature of the people, yeah? And uh, other than that, we also have our great um, skilled labor force with, where they are trained in the hospitality industry. Most of them actually have already been exported to Rwanda. Most of these hotels are taken care of by Kenyans, not only Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and of late, uh, we did uh, uh, a direct flight to Dubai. And if you go to Dubai, the labor force is also Kenyans, majorly. So I think we, 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 it was intentional that we have a specific training institution that is able to capacity, capacity build staff so that they are able to offer excellent service. Okay, probably that is one thing that we have unique. The other, of course, we have like uh, everything that is everywhere, including our climate. Our climate is uh, 24. Uh, seven in this we have if you want to we, we we have the mount kenya which has snow in africa of course we, our region is also i think we are lucky because of the location of kenya itself being that uh, it neighbors of uh, the east african community i think it is the capital headquarter of the east african community and we are we work with our neighbors we as kenya i think what I've even come to learn here in Meeting Africa, I think it's really advantageous when we market as one. So right now we are marketing as Africa. Uh, for Kenya specifically, what we have uh, put in place is we are going to intensify our regional marketing. We want to invite our brothers and sisters in Africa to come to Kenya every day. And of course, domestic. And uh, when we do the domestic uh, marketing, we are able to show the, the, the business person you've talked about how they can make money, how tourism trickles down to the economy, and how they are benefiting. For a long time, I think um, tourism was being seen as any other thing that you want to do if you are not very serious in, in uh, maybe accounting, law, and uh, stuff like that. But right now, everybody is able to see and uh, to see how they are earning from, from tourism-related activities. So once you have been able to sensitize the country and tell them that you can always do this business and this business will give you money in your pocket, I think um, that's a great thing. And if, if it is like in the DNA of everybody, so tourism becomes also one of the best uh, looked for career in life. Mm. Uh, tourism also, um, because of the agricultural aspect, 
you're able to show the farmer in the village that this, whatever it is that you're planting, is going to earn you money through tourism this way. Mm. So once they have understood that, because in Kenya for us, we do a lot of stakeholder engagements. We work together with the private partners because they are mainly the drivers of tourism-related activities. So for government, government just comes in and do, does the policy issues, but the sector players themselves, they are in charge. Mm. And actually, even uh, currently here, we've come with a team of uh, parliamentarians who are mainly focused on tourism and wildlife. Other than that, our ministry uh, the other day, His Excellency, our president, made sure that it has combined tourism, wildlife, culture, and heritage mm. under one ministry, which is really good because you're able then to synergize. You're able to, be, uh, you're able to sell culture, our heritage, tourism, and wildlife in one go. <laughs> Thank you. So you've really got to know yourself. You've got to know what you, who your people are. You've got to let everybody participate. And, you, and, and again, I say I love the consistency. Over the many years, you've been so consistent on who you are and what your offering is. You're not even going through half of it. I mean, I could talk to Thank all the, you. the way in which you let people interact with wildlife. is very different, again, to, you know, us sitting in the four by fours and, you know, you're driving through and you see five koalas in one hour uh, or, you know, five, what are they, bush babies? I mean, Somebody get rid of the bush babies in South Africa because there are just too many of them. Oh, no, that, that could have not been kosher. Probably but let, let me also uh, add yes. just a bit. We also have our famous sports tourism. Sports so, tourism yeah, as well? Not, yes. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Our athletes, you know, they... They just market the country. Oh, yes, yes, and that's what he was talking about, about how the athletes actually go out and, um, and, they, and they actually represent to the world a narrative about the country. But I, I don't think we're doing well enough, and nice point, we, it's, one, it's one continent. You know, what yes. are we doing about making, the, uh, making ourselves attractive to each other before we actually make ourselves attractive to the broader world? And also, ease of transportation. It is not easy to get around in the continent. What are your thoughts on that? Um, really, it starts with this. Uh, I find meetings Africa as the uh, central point for all of us as a continent, and uh, I think we really fail home. Uh, that's number one. And the, with the, the opportunity we all have here at hand, we're able to do business together. Um, as you know, our business sometimes it's a, if it's an association conference or an event, it's going to rotate. So. Uh, while I'm here, I'm going to speak to my sister from Kenya, I'm going to speak to my brother from South Africa, and we're going to exchange business. So uh, I really feel that Meetings Africa provides that uh, opportunity for us to network and do business together. But more importantly, openly have open discussions about the issues we're all facing, whether it's the airlift, uh, whether it's you know, partnerships in skills, as the, uh, we mentioned. Uh, this is a platform for us to engage and really talk and go into the details of what we can do. And we've seen results from the past where we've been able to uh, share events and we've seen events rotating within our, our countries and this is really a uh, time for the continent. We can't rely on what is going to come from outside the continent when there's already an opportunity for us. Uh, the challenge we've had in the past, we have not been speaking, but we need to leave that level. We need to move to the next level do business, do practical business, exchange business, uh, do business. If I know something is happening in South Africa, recommend to Kenya, recommend to Rwanda, recommend to other African countries that are here. That's what we mean by doing business. And, and we, we, we saw what COVID did to the industry. I mean, that was a catastrophe for the industry. What were your thoughts on how you built agility into your country considering that this is not necessarily something we can't expect to happen again. You know, if we again were to be faced with a dramatic, either climatic or um, um, disease uh, challenge, you know, what are some of the points that we've learned around how do we build resilience? Uh, I think the first lesson we learned as a country, one was that the business within ourselves, uh, one really we first looked at within the country, Rwanda, and the, uh, even before the borders the opened, we started doing the internal meetings, and that supported the, the industry, supported the venues, supported the, the hotels, supported the restaurants. And with the borders opening and the, you know countries opening up, we realized our focus is now on the continent. Before we, you know, 
uh, went to other uh, places. And so uh, that's the one, I think, opportunity we, we got out of uh, the pandemic. Uh, we, we learned that really the immediate business is on the continent, and that's where we need to focus. And the, um, we, 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 we got that because there was also a clear uh, message and the direction uh, from our leadership. Uh, we all know we worked hard as governments and as private sector to ensure that we reopen business. If uh, the governments were not prioritizing tourism and the you know business events, we wouldn't have opened at the earlier stages we did. But the government really put forward and the, uh, invested and they put all the protocols in place for us to open. And the, the case of Rwanda, uh, tourism was one of the first events that he really opened up. And the, we, with that, we also learned that we had to actually be uh, agile in terms of, uh, you know, diversifying what we're doing as a country. And the sports tourism came out strongly. Um, out of the, you know, uh, pandemic, we signed the two international events on sports. Uh, one was Ironman that was hosted the last year in July, and it is going to come back. Uh, this year we've developed partnership with the global brand to do Ironman in Rwanda. And that uh, showed us that uh, with meetings, some, sometimes you would be limited or you could do your meetings virtually. But with sporting events, you need to be together. You need to compete. And when you compete, you're in a destination. So the dollars, the foreign currency we're looking at, it still comes into your destination. So a lot of opportunities really came out. A BL came to Rwanda during that period, very hard period. We hosted the first event in 2020. Huge success, opened up, created confidence, and the people started really coming back. A lot of people came for the event with fear, but after that, they were very confident. They went back and really became ambassadors to open up the destination. So I think when there's a, a clear direction and a clear policy and a clear strategy to uh, reopen and reinvest in the industry, everything is possible. And that's why we continue to push uh, representing the government, but also we get to see uh, the feedback from our private sector who are so uh, key players in that. Mm, thank you. And how did you manage? And how do, what were the big lessons learned? Great lessons shared. What were the great lessons you've learned? For Kenya, it was really amazing. Uh, one of the great lessons that we learned was uh, domestic tourism. We were able to, to be each other's brothers and uh, be able to utilize what we had. Of course, the protocols were really uh, well received and well um, managed by the relevant uh, uh, bodies like the Ministry of Health. They kept giving uh, a lot of information about COVID and of course, encouragement. And like I said, in Kenya, it's really our tourism is uh, private sector driven greatly. So most people were able to quickly just adhere to all the protocols that were, were, were laid out. Uh, further, uh, I would also want to mention that in East African community, we host, we, we, we rotationally host um, the East African Tourism Association. So this, this year, it's coming to Kenya. We were in Burundi uh, last year. So it's kind of rotational. And then from this uh, rotational uh, holding these events, we are able to learn from each other. Of course, we are also able to, 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 to get, we don't compete. It is not about competition anymore. It's about just, uh, what is it called? Partnership and collaboration so that we can be able to pick the best practice out of each other and be able, if, if I am good at one thing, we are able to, uh, to uh, empower our neighbors on, uh, on any particular skill that you are good at. Mm. And of course, for Kenya, uh, sports tourism was also affected when it came to COVID. However, we kept practicing because you're, you're doing it. We do it in our high mountains and um, on the roads and stuff like that. So most people really became healthy, if I would say that is a good lesson mm -hmm. that we learned from COVID, having taken uh, into consideration all the protocols. So everybody was aware and everybody became their brother's keepers. Mm. Thank you. Amazing. You're so true. The huge campaigns even in South Africa around taking care of people in hospitality. So it really helped to elevate the industry. I mean, it, it's sad to say that something like COVID really helped to say, remember these people, remember the artists. We had to remember everybody not seen. Um, but, but Emma, not to belabor, I think, the same topic. I think um, also once you've built up your tourism, there's so much that gets affected when things go wrong. So with our energy crisis, there's so much that gets affected. For example, we've 
very big on um, the international movie, movie production scene. So when things don't go well, you know, the impacts continue and we're not aware of it. What would you say we need to be mindful of that you are having to manage that we can't even see at this point? So just to hook on to what was said about what we learned inside of COVID. Domestic tourism, domestic tourism, domestic tourism. You know, if you look at uh, more advanced, you know, tourism destinations, they've got very strong domestic uh, uh, tourism markets and strong regional markets. So that's what we learned. Build your domestic market strong. It also makes the citizens become greater participants in hosting people that come from outside. And it creates, you know, uh, that thing you were talking about where everybody seems to be in tourism, even if their business is not directly inside the tourism sector. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing that we, we, we learned is also, you know, the interregional, you know, um, collaboration to make sure that we travel within the continent. And so if we win a bid, for example, from an overseas market, we should then help another African country to win the same bid. And that is, I guess, what you know, we've been talking about, that we've got to start learning from one another on how everything that we've won, we share. And, and so that it stays on the continent. And in order to do that, you, you have to collaborate at a policy level. You've got to collaborate you know, in, in, you know, also from a private sector standpoint because you've got private uh, uh, entities that have got holdings in other countries. So being able to work with the private sector to be able to have that kind of level of collaboration. So there's a lot of that stuff that we are managing in the background that a lot of people do not, do not see. Also just in terms of making sure that when bookings are done, the money actually hits your economy. So one of the things that people don't see in, in the value chain is it's very easy for a tour to be booked in a, you know, in, in, in a buying switch that is sitting outside of your economy. So the people come to the country, but the money doesn't hit your, your actual economy. So it's also about managing how those transactions are structured so that the money actually does come into your economy and not just the spend that people make when they're on the ground. So there's a lot of stuff in the background that we work on to make sure that we optimize the actual economic impact of, 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 of tourism. I just want to say this one last thing. Content, 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 content. You see, you are what, as a destination, you are what people see when they search you. So if you typed in South Africa right now on Google, what comes up? And so us being able to manage the search environment, firstly, us also being able to, you know, optimize the social media environment, and us being intentional about what pictures, what videos, what content is projected to the rest of the world, being able to buy those search words, being able to be very intentional in the content space is really one of the biggest pushes across, across the continent. If you look at where life is going, life is going digital. If you do not have a digital presence that is appealing, then you're not going to get your share. And if there's one space that we need to build as a continent, we've got the product, we've got the experience, we've got, you know, it's there, but the world doesn't experience it the way that it actually is on the ground. And for me, that is the next frontier. And that is why we need more young people involved in the sector. We need, you know, a, a new, a completely new set of people or players, both at a product level, at an experience provisioning level, and also just being able to go to market, not just from a traditional leisure, business event standpoint, but that middle section, which is sports, arts, you know, uh, fashion, film, all of those spaces where the, the creative arts are, and using that to really push a new narrative and a new recognition for what our product actually has to offer. And that, for me, is the next frontier mm. for tourism. And, uh, and, and, and I think the world has really missed out on what the continent is about. Um, if you go in and look at TikTok and you look at the questions, I, I don't know if anybody, I'm, if you should be on TikTok. 
You should all be on TikTok. It's really unbelievable. People's perceptions of what the continent was about. First of all, the fact that it's not one country is, is a revelation still. Every day somebody's learning that we are not just one, one country. Um, but also what, what you find and what you can do. And it's young people again who are teaching the rest of the world and even each other about who we are. How are we going to ride on, first of all, if we're not in that space, as you're saying, we're in trouble. How are we going to leverage young people? How are we going to leverage these mediums to resell the real view of who we are as a continent and each and every country? Uh, I think the first thing is really to showcase what we have as a continent. And the, the first thing we need to do is to tell the real story of what we have. Uh, and diversity is what we have. We really diverse look at the continent from uh, north to south, west to east. We total, we different, we have unique experiences and uh, that's what has been lacking. We haven't told the story and it's really our time to, uh, to tell the story and of course we call upon the support and the collaboration of the media. There's no better way we can do that without really the, having the support of the media. And uh, once you understand that, then you're able to you know, create the experiences you, you, you want to showcase. You are able to tell the story. There's uh, a lot of innovation that is out there. There's uh, a lot of young talent that is uh, undiscovered. And this is uh, an opportunity for us from uh, uh, destination point of view, how do we engage the rest of the departments? How do we engage the private sector? How do we find out the talents that are there that need, need to be showcased and be, you know, be taken to the next level? And if we continue to do that, then absolutely we're going to create opportunities for, for us as, uh, as countries, but also as continent. Uh, of course, there are uh, different initiatives that are happening in different uh, countries. You've seen what has happened in Rwanda, uh, the partnership we've had with Visit Rwanda with the, some of the big um, uh, global organizations that have also elevated the you know the image and the uh, perception of the country you meet some people that have never been to Rwanda but they tell you oh we've seen visit Rwanda somewhere and that's uh, again a great step towards really showcasing and marketing your country uh, in addition to the social media we need also to look at uh, our unique experiences and use the strong partnerships and engagements we have uh, to continue to tell the story Hmm. And uh, Visit Rwanda is really fascinating. The homecoming revolution in Ghana. Everybody's managing to like coin one thing. Um, what, are, what are you coining and how are you finding the youth telling the story of Kenya? Actually, in Kenya, one of the strategies that we are, we are looking at is um, we want to know how to identify, uh, how to tap into the interest of the independent traveler. You know, business events are normally sponsored by organizations, right? How about this independent traveler? And that is basically the youth. And, you know, uh, the most interesting thing about the youth is that they, they, they are so violent. I mean, they are so dynamic. They wouldn't want to, for example, stay in one place for a long time. So then how are you going to be able to diversify all the products that you have as a country, specifically to target the youth? And this is one of the strategies that we have as a ministry that we are, we are, we are encouraging and uh, bringing the youth on board in terms of what they think, how they would want to, to be able to, to, to be comfortable at their own space. Sometimes they don't even want to leave the house, but they still want to travel. So how do you then do you offer that? You will come in, <laughs> are you laughing? You will come into in what? Virtual, uh, virtual uh, of course, digital presence. And probably that is where we all need to be looking at to be able to, to get their interest. How do you provide that? For example, our great Masai Mara. How does that Masai Mara come to the bedroom? Of course, through digital media, isn't it? So those are some of the big things that we are doing. And um, I think going that direction, the digital space, we will be able to, 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 to get something in tourism. Lastly, oh, one, one thing that I, uh, I, I forgot to say is, um, is this thing. Um, hmm. Okay, I've talked about the product diversification and the youth, and generally also the women, uh, the less, uh, the, the, the vulnerable uh, in the community. Like I said earlier that uh, we have to encourage them and then they can see what is it that tourism is doing for them? I like what my brother has talked about, the storytelling. In fact, history, our culture, are we able to package it well? I like what he says in terms of content creation. What is this content that we are, we are packaging as tourism? Where is our history? 
like for us in KICC, we were born in 1973, and we are going to be enjoying our Jubilee this year, 50 years. So 50 years of history that is in that building is amazing. It's, a, it's something that we would want to package it to our youth. We're also providing them space where they can come and display their artwork so that we provide them one-stop shop on or, or selling their, their, of course, so that they can also be able to benefit some of the, what we're talking about, tourism. If you give them that space to sell their art, you see, they will be able to appreciate and understand that, oh, uh, this tourism is actually going, is a sustaining uh, activity for one's life. Also, the women, we provide them space where they can come and sell their wares, our traditional uh, Maasai wares. You're able to get it at KICC. Mm. Thank you. Those are always worthwhile events to go to because you get the most fantastic things. Um, but I think you, you saved our life during COVID with those Maasai Mara tours because they were on National Geographic, you would just be able to sit in the house and you felt like you were in the you, bush. Exactly. It saved our lives. I love that you have so many challenges. You've got to think about things differently and technology can be ignored. Technology yes. is going to be brought in. Yes. But also um, the story of the media, because technology is so powerful. There's so much content being said about each and every country, and we look at South Africa now. It's literally going to be very difficult to get above the, 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 the political stories, the social stories, um, the more the more difficult story that the media has to handle, and 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 still elevate what the value proposition is um, for for any for any given country. I mean, how, how would you, you know, how, how, how are you going to manage that? I think it's a massive challenge. Absolutely it is. But one of the things that we do know is that one of the biggest drivers for tourism for the next 30 to 50 years, based on, you know, climate change and everything that's happening in the world, is sustainability and conservation. Big, big, big drivers for tourism. So any country that is able to capture that particular positioning will be able, because, you know, the, the, the people that are going to be traveling now, uh, I mean, in, in, in 20 years' time, you know, are probably 18 now, 15 now. And this generation cares most about the continent than any other generation in the history of the world. So being able to position your country on sustainability and conservation is absolutely critical. So if you look at, you know... Uh, sand parks, for example, our, you know, our, our conservation platform and our you know, game park uh, platform, for me, that is one of our biggest competitive advantages going forward because that is how we're going to be able to position going forward. Our scientists there, the, the kind of stuff that is being done in our parks is absolutely groundbreaking. So us being able to, you know, to leverage that going forward is, is going to be important. That's, you know, that, that, that's the first thing. The second thing which is linked you know, uh, to that is inclusivity. So being able to say, as we do the conservation stuff, as we do the sustainable tourism development, how does it take the people that are around those, you know, uh, those parks, around those, those attractions, into the economy that is generated from the sustainable you know, tourism platform? And this generation that will be traveling going forward cares about what we do for the citizens of, the, you know, of, of a country. And because of social media, they are able to share that stuff. And so what we're going to build going forward will be built around that. Lastly, in case you don't come back to me, let me just say this. And let me speak prophetically, right? When we win, for the fourth time, the Rugby World Cup in France this year, and our captain, Sia Colisi, stands in front of billions of people. What comes out of his mouth about the destination is critical. That comes back to the whole exceptionalism platform. We really need to leverage our athletes, leverage all of our powerful musicians, uh, you know, our talent that we export, to be able to articulate the African story in a way that is powerful, that is attractive, and that makes people want to come to the country because they already have the admiration of the world. And what they say counts a lot more than what a tourism authority would say. Thank you so much. Um, and I think uh, we all have the opportunity to, to prophetically say, when we get... <laughs> so, Patricia, what's your ambition? When you get, when you see this, you'll be happy. Not when we, I think... 
We will. We will. We will. <laughs> yeah. It will happen. So for my brother, yeah, I pray for him very um with all the Because then it comes to you after. Yes, it will of course. And probably what I what I wanted to mention was that there's this visa thing that we're really grateful for South Africa that we came in free. Um yeah, that's a plus. Yeah. In East African community, for example, we, we go in with our identity cards. We don't have to even use a passport. So it's that easy. Yes. So uh, going forward, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm looking at a very bright future. Uh, for Kenya, uh, we are looking at hosting the Global Climate Change uh, Conference which uh, next year. So when next year will reach? It is not about <laughs> when we will. No, it's about it's just the time, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And you will be all and welcome to Kenya. Of course, globally, uh, climate change is affecting all of us, and it's a must. I think mm. this will give, add a lot of value when it comes to sustainable tourism. Mm. So we cannot ignore that. Whether we like it or not, it's happening. Our youth are so frantic about the same, and they've, like, they've taken it their agenda, which is a big shame on us for the elder, the elder ones. Yes. But however, I think every time, everybody has an opportunity to do something, and for our youth, I think kudos to them. Thank you. And we'll be praying for you, so I hope that you get that, and I'll be there we next year. We are getting, yeah. we are getting. You, get, you yeah. are getting we it. We are getting. Prophetic uh, aspirations, I've probably got two more minutes. Uh, I think I just want to support my brother that when he, South Africa wins, the continent is winning. Yes. So I think really that's the, the, the key message for all of us, that we win as a continent. And uh, I would like to share that uh, Rand is open for business. We're hosting major events. And uh, one of the key ones I would really like to invite uh, the audience here and uh, our sisters and brothers here is the, the World uh, Travel and Tourism Council that is happening in November this year. It's a big event coming for the first time on the continent to Rwanda. And so again, it's a big win for, for the continent. Let's support each other. Let's be there for, for, for each other. Uh, and thank you for the platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's it for our wonderful guest today. Thank you so much, Tamba Patricia. Thank you so much. Let's give him a round of applause. And thank you for joining us. We really appreciated it. Well, that's it for our conversation today. I think Meetings Africa has done a fantastic job of bringing us together to have the conversation around one continent, um, probably one dream, one vision for all of us to succeed. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.